God would have his people realize that Mr. Armstrong isn't alive because he just happens to have a little better health than other people, and therefore he's alive and well as a result of good health, rather than he's alive and well because God wants the man alive and well. I think Mr. Armstrong's life is not there now because it's just by chance. I think he's there because he is the most important man on the face of this earth, to God that is. That he is the key to this work, he is the key to this church, and he is the key to world affairs in the working out of biblical prophecy. And I've said, you've heard me say here many a time, that Mr. Armstrong is alive and will remain alive to the end of this work, not because he just happens to be, you know, maybe a little better health, but because God Almighty is there and he's already proved through Methuselah he can keep a man alive 969 years. And I've made the statement here that if it's necessary for Mr. Armstrong to live another so many years, God will keep him alive because he's already proved that he can keep a man alive. You know, if you keep a man alive 969 years, I don't think it's any great struggle, any terrific strain on God. He doesn't have to get his wheaties to keep a man alive uh, to the point of 100 years or so, whatever. Not sure. I think you'll have to keep Mr. Armstrong alive until he's about 90 years of age. That's about five more years. And I think he'll just keep him alive forever from that juncture on. Of course, he'll probably die for three and a half days there. I'm not saying anything. He said he might die for three and a half days just before Christ comes. Now, I'm not saying he's one of the two witnesses. I'm just saying he might die for three and a half days in Jerusalem. You know, I don't think I'll die there, but I think he might. I think the death is really going to come there and not before. I think he's the key. Mr. Ted Armstrong, I don't know if you've heard the tape, but you will be hearing the tape in regard to the times of the Gentiles in which he pretty well goes in to show that 2,520 years from 539 B.C. is 1982, which is the time the Gentiles are to end. I'm not going to try to preempt the sermon except to say this. At the end of the sermon, Mr. Ted Armstrong said, if he were a gambling man, he would not bet against 1982 being the date. Now, if that is true, and I don't see how it could be much longer, because I think history substantiates sufficiently the fall of Babylon as being 539 B.C. And if that's the case, then you count 2,520 years to come to 1982. Now, if that is the time when the Gentiles end, and... Uh, there's only one individual who can end the times of the Gentiles, and that's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. No one else is going to bring about an end of the Gentile rule because the Gentiles are getting stronger and stronger, and the Israelites are getting weaker and weaker. So if that be the case, you count back three and a half years, and that's when the two witnesses start. Now, if the two witnesses start three and a half years before that, that's uh, the early part of 1979. That means this work has to be over before the two witnesses start. So you count back a little bit more, and that's about five years. In other words, about five years now. Give us about a year and a half to finish the work here, a little less than that. And then time to get to the place of final training, time for the two witnesses to get to Jerusalem, and they'll work in and out of the place of final training, because they're going to keep supervising the work. God isn't going to drop two witnesses down from heaven. They're not going to come up out of the turnip patch. They're not going to come out of the uh, woodwork. They're not just going to appear. Someone says, who are you? Where are the two witnesses? Where'd you come from? Beat up? We don't know. We weren't here before. <laughs> and when you read Revelation 11, it doesn't say that's when God starts the two witnesses. It says that's when he gives his two witnesses power. The implication is quite plain. They're already his two witnesses. That's when he gives them power. He says that's when I will give my two witnesses power. I believe that's about the way it is, isn't it? Let me turn over here to Hezekiah. We'll check that out. Hezekiah, the 11th chapter. You didn't find Hezekiah, did you? 
I think all of you know that's Revelation. The 11th chapter, verse 3, and he says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now the implication is that the two witnesses are already serving him. This is when he gives them power. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now why would God have packed them by olive trees and candlesticks? Why does he pack them by mesquite trees and uh and uh uh well uh you couldn't very well use anything that eliminates it might be somewhat of a type. But olive trees represent God's Holy Spirit. In other words, olive trees produce olives, naturally, and you get olive oil from olives. And olive oil is a type of God's Holy Spirit. And the reason God has chosen the olive tree to be the tree that produces that which is symbolic of his Holy Spirit is because the olive tree is that tree that seems to be ageless. There are olive trees right today that Jesus Christ saw in the valley or the Garden of Gethsemane. Well over 2,000 years of age, no telling how old they were when he first saw them. So God typifies these two men as olive trees, in other words, men that are going to be, have to be filled with his Holy Spirit. So he doesn't uh, type them by mesquite trees, that wouldn't be typical, it would not be symbolic. And his candlesticks, because candles give off light. So God will empower the men through his Holy Spirit, and they in turn will reveal the light of his way, will explain his plan. And really, back in uh, Zechariah, God shows these two olive trees around the uh, candlestick, or the uh, candelabra. In other words, showing that the world will never really know why God built the church until these two men explain it to the world. And they're going to explain it because they're going to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. They're going to function like candles, you know, to illuminate, to reveal why God built the church. Basically, to get this work done. Basically, to have a means, a vehicle by way which he could prepare the way for his second coming. Jesus Christ could prepare the way for his second coming and develop and train a group of individuals who can begin to teach Israelites who are going to be brought to repentance as a result of this work of the tribulation. And he says, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouths, or their mouth, and devours their enemies. You think God could use a couple of recruits, a couple of uh, uh, Johnny on the spot to be individuals who have that much faith, and he could trust them to use the power constructively? What if you and I had the power to cause fire to proceed out of our mouth and destroy our enemies? Some of us wouldn't be sitting here. Because someone else here who, who didn't like us at one time maybe had their toes set on with a, you know, <laughs> breathe fire out. <laughs> So they have to be men that have enough wisdom and enough knowledge of God's plan to know how God would want it done, and also be men that God has been able to inspire and give wisdom to, and devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven. That it rained not in the days of their prophecy. Now, some people think they've already been around because they shut the heavens over Texas. But now they really haven't. These have power to shut heaven that it rained not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Why would God give two men power to do that? Stop the rain for three and a half years, wherever they want, and also to send plagues out on people as they choose. Well, first of all, God had a prophet named Elijah. And God established an office through that prophet, and that office was established for an overall purpose. The overall purpose of that office is to turn the whole world to worshiping God and away from Satan the devil. That office was established through the prophet Elijah. That office 
has been filled and is being filled by two other men from the time God established the office through Elijah. One of them was John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Christ's first coming. The other one happens to be Mr. Armstrong, who is preparing the way for Christ's second coming. If that's not the case, God's going to have to do some mighty speedy work to raise up a man to fulfill all that. He only has about a year or so, because all conditions around the world indicate we are near the end. If I were a betting man, I wouldn't bet you if you gave me a hundred to one odds that the United States will last 15 more years. I don't think it'll last five. I don't think most people realize how very uh, bad are conditions in these United States. For the whole western half of the United States under severe drought, and the eastern side under sharks. You know, those two lake ones. If you ever go to Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, New York, Detroit, you realize what I mean. You know, just crime-infested uh, cities ruled by mobsters and various mafia groups and so forth. Have you viewed the world scene recently and seen how precarious it is and how near it is to forcing the United States of Europe on the scene? I may have said this to you before I left. Maybe I didn't. But there are true two areas on the face of this earth that are triggering areas to bring about the coming tribulation. One is the Middle East and primarily Israel. The other one is South Africa. And we are forcing those two nations to turn to Europe. And Europe is forced to back them up or the communist world will take over. So the triggering agents to bring about the downfall of the Western world and to promote the United States of Europe are already there. Now, why are they the triggering agents? Europe cannot survive another oil embargo. That is their lifeblood. They cannot allow the communist world to come in, take over the Middle East, and then dictate to whom they will allow oil to be sent. Now, as the United States backs off like a weak kneed uh, jellyfish, we are opening up the door for communism to take over the Middle East. Europe cannot allow that. What are they going to do about it? They're going to have to secure the Middle East for themselves. Now, in addition, Europe cannot allow the communists to take over Africa. And especially South Africa, because once you have South Africa, you have control of the rest of Africa. So as we back off, the communists move in. So the Europeans, who have always wanted the African continent to make sure they have the vast raw materials in the strategic area for defense and shipping that South Africa allows, and the rest of the continent allows so far as natural resources are concerned, now, do you think we're backing off? We're forcing the South Africans to take a stance, which they did last week, that is, this week. They finally began to close down some of these radical black movements, and they're radical, and they're communist-inspired, and let no one tell you otherwise. You know what? Their uh, prime minister and their uh, minister of the interior, I believe it was, had to say, said, we had to conclude that it is far more important that our country survives than what the world thinks of us. We have to put our country before world opinion. And so Prime Minister Foster said, really, I don't care what President Carter and your people of the United States have to say. We just don't care anymore. Well, since we are backing off and we're trying to force them not only are we backing off, we're trying to force them into a stance that they know is suicidal. What do you, how do you think Europe views that? They view it as opening the door to communism. Now, when we back off and will not give the Israelis support, 
the Israelis have to turn to someone because they know they cannot fight the communist world and the Arab world on their own. So South Africa and Israel are in a predicament where they have to turn to Europe, and more particularly to the Germans. You know why? Because the Germans are a very strong, militaristic type people. Did you see when they gave their commandos a reception, a return to Germany the other day? It was almost like a military celebration, a victory. You see the, the built-in attitude of the German people. They're a warlike people. They're just waiting until they can flex their muscles and begin to dictate policies that conform to what they want. Now, if I were an Israeli, and if you were an Israeli down in the Middle East, and you knew you were surrounded by Arabs who would like to cut your throat, and those Arabs were being supported by the communist world, and you can see the weak kneed jellyfish, do good or nation the United States backing off, and you could not rely on, upon them to back up Israel in the in face of a conflict, and you knew it would be suicide to turn to the communist world, where would you look? There's only one place to look otherwise. That's Europe. If you were in South Africa, and you knew your leaders had always been favorable toward the Germans. Did you know that? Prime Minister Foster was an enemy of the state, so to speak. Not outright, but uh, put in internment camp during World War II. Because when South Africa voted to either follow back up Britain or the United States, when they went into war, went to war in 1939, the South African Parliament voted to back Britain only by a slight margin. And the reason they did is because the party in power at that time was the United Party, which was the English Party. Now the other party, the National Party, headed by Afrikaners, Dutch-speaking peoples, or Afrikaans-speaking peoples, they, they wanted to back Germany. So when the government decided to back Britain, these individuals remain loyal to Germany. So much so that they became uh, enemies of the United Party because they were more in support of the Germans than they were the Britons. So what they finally had to do for the sake of the uh, South Africa and that they could manage South Africa according to the United Party's policy and give full support to the British people, they in turn various leaders of the African society and government. One of them was Prime Minister Foster. That's way back before, of course, he was Prime Minister. His brother, who was the top uh, minister in the Dutch Reformed Church. And the former and late Dr. Vivert, who was the Prime Minister when I was in South Africa, he was also interned. So a lot of those leaders were interned during World War II because they were sympathetic toward the Germans. Now, after World War II was over, they divided the British by propaganda, and they united their own party and won the government in 1968. So when the National Party came on the scene and took over in 1968, we find people in charge of South Africa who did not like the British and who supported the Germans in World War II, and who have continued to look the Germans ever since. Now, if you were in South Africa, and you knew how the United States had backed off with their slew flooding ways, and you knew the Congress were right in Angola and working in to take over Rhodesia, and the next step would be to take over your country, and you could not rely on Britain and the United States, and you could not stand the, the thought of becoming partial of the uh, communist world, to whom would you turn? Germans that you're compatible with, that you've always wanted to support, that you feel once they have the power, they'll back you up and they won't tolerate all this politicking with blacks, which is the case of the United States. Mr. Carter just going to have to realize he's not yet God. He's trying to play God. He's trying to do what only Jesus Christ of Nazareth can do, bring human rights to the whole world. 
world doesn't want human rights even in Washington all that much. Do you know that? Do you know why dictators are dictators? Because the people don't have rights. Now, if those people had human rights or they, uh, the power to vote, those leaders would lose their power. So they're not after human rights. Jesus Christ were here in the world today, he would not be trying to clean it up. Do you know that? He'd have to be a war-making leader. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, because this is a fighting world. So the, uh, you know, the communists have great praise underneath, under cover for President Carter's human rights program. Because if he get it, if they, they realize if, if all these do-gooders over here, uh, you know, believe in uh, pacifism and can get a lot of other nations, they can take over the world. It's a great advantage to them. So Mr. Carter and the Carter administration, a lot of other do-gooders in Washington, have to realize they can't change the world. It's going to take Jesus Christ of Nazareth to do that. Now what the Israelis in the South Africa's reading that is a lot of do-gooders over here they can't depend on, and a lot of vicious bears over the communist world would like to devour them, and right on their doorsteps there's only one place to turn, to Europe, and to a German-led Europe that will give them full military backing and protection, and back up the Israelis and say, okay, Israelis, we're going to back you up, and we want you to keep these... Uh, Arabs under control. You think they would? <laughs> or would they? All they do is they sheep them right quick. Say, pump oil, boys. Pump oil. <laughs> and they think, is this enough? And uh, the Germans are going to give the, black, the South Africans support and say, we're going to back you up fully, and we want you to keep the rest of Africa in line with Europe. And they're just the people with that kind of support will do it. So there's an affinity between South Africa and the Israelis and the Germans. Even though the Germans, I know, slaughtered a lot, but they realize it's a matter of survival now. And of course, they're sort of, like most people, think, well, the Germans have kind of changed that sense, you know, as far as uh, uh, not treating them so badly in the past, because, as, as in the past, because this time the Israelis are in a strategic position that Germany needs. See, Europe needs a stable Middle East to ensure the oil flows to Europe. And there's only one way to have a stable Middle East. That's to keep the communist world out and to back up the Israelis and calm down and keep under control the Arabs. And there's only one out for the South Africans who look to the same people. So these two triggering agents to force the United States of Europe to come to the scene, the Germans take control lest the world be overcome by communism, are already there. That's how near the end we are. Now, I knew that God would have to, in a certain way, show Mr. Armstrong when it was time to, you know, to, he'd already reached a sufficient number of world leaders. It's time to concentrate on his people, Joseph, and warn them before the coming tribulation, because the tribulation is upon the Josephites, who must come to repentance first. And more profoundly. Why? Because they're going to be the leaders of the world on earth. Most people have forgotten what Joseph dreamed back there in, in the Old Testament. But they will realize that dream had to do with us today. When Joseph dreamed the dream that showed him all of his brothers would have to bow down to him. And God brought that about. Now the brothers of Joseph today hate him just as much as the brothers back then hated him. So how would God ever get the brothers of Joseph to cooperate to come into the land of Palestine with him and serve under him and with him. Except God let history repeat itself. And he let the brothers today of Joseph have to do with selling Joseph into spiritual Egypt, Europe. And then they're going to be warned, first of all, of that. That's where the two witnesses come in. Then they're going to go ahead and betray their brother Joseph and join the United States of Europe and have to do with selling their own kind into slavery. And then in slavery they're going to come to realize as they see their brother Joseph being systematically destroyed 
that he's their only hope unless Joseph survives to, survive to be the one through whom the government of God blesses them. They don't stand a chance. So as long as they're going to be willing to pull out of the United States of Europe combine and repent of their attitude toward Joseph and be willing to follow him to the land of Palestine when Christ intervenes to deliver the Israelites into the land of Palestine. So in order for the Josephites to learn the lesson first, they have to be warned first. And they have to be warned just in advance of the tribulation. Now, do you think God could have ever gotten Mr. Armstrong before the President the Congress unless he reached world leaders? He wouldn't carry any weight. But he does today. The State Department knows that Mr. Armstrong has visited more world leaders than anyone else on the face of the earth. More than their State Department could have done if they tried. I don't know if you heard this during the feast or not. We did. That when President Ford was in office, he and Mr. Kissinger were discussing Mr. Armstrong and the presence of one who knew Mr. Raider. And they were discussing how Mr. Armstrong had reached more world leaders than their State Department. And they were wondering how the man worked it out. So when a man has been discussed by a president and his secretary of state, and they have been fed a lot of information by the CIA and the State Department as to how many kings and prime ministers and presidents he had visited, you can imagine that if a man were to go before the president today and the Congress, they're going to be fully aware that this man is no Johnny on the spot newcomer. That this man is a man of substance because he has been reached. He has reached more world leaders than anyone else on the face of the earth. And just that will command respect toward Mr. Armstrong that he wouldn't have had otherwise. If he had never visited world leaders, he would never be able to go before the president of Congress and get their attention there here long enough to explain God's plan and give them a warning. So it looks like God has slowed Mr. Armstrong down and said, that's enough over there, I want you to stay here. And as long as you want to raise him up so far, that's where he stays. I think it's only a matter of time and God will raise him up sufficiently to reach the president and the Congress and then later, the Parliament in Canada, the Parliament in Great Britain, the Parliament in Australia and South Africa, and realize it's time to give them the last warning. And he'd go before the President of the Congress, explain God's plan, briefly, and then say, it's obvious you people in this nation won't believe it, because I've been proclaiming this for 45 plus years, and you've continued the same old way. But you're going to come to realize this is your only hope. God's your only hope because this nation is about to go into a national captivity. There is coming the United States of Europe, headed by the Pope and a uh, military leader. And that power is going to be great in the United States or, Britain, or uh, the communist world. And it is going to attack and destroy this country overnight. And it's going to take the remaining people into captivity. They won't believe that. They'll listen. Then when Mr. Armstrong is gone and things begin to happen, they're going to realize there was a servant of God among them. But he's not among them at that time. As Ezekiel brings it out, Ezekiel 33. He says that when these things happen, and lo, they will happen, then they're going to know that a prophet was among them. He's no longer among them. He was among them. you think Christ could ever get all the Israelites together, repentant, and willing to follow him in the land of Palestine, saying, show us the way to Jerusalem, put up way marks to Zion, and we want to make a new covenant with you. You have to know it before you can make a covenant with him. Now, how would they ever come to know Christ except Mr. Armstrong and Ted blast that message as a final witness and a warning? in such power that most of the people hear it, especially all the leaders, hear that final message and that final warning. Someone's got to do it. Because you can't fulfill all those prophecies which show the Israelites being delivered out of the North Country in an exodus that's so much greater than the one out of Egypt that they'll forget the one out of Egypt and they'll remember the exodus under the Lord out of the North Country when the Lord delivers them out of the north country. 
And also when he makes Ephraim the leading peoples of that twelve nation combine or twelve tribe combine. You've read over there, I think, in Jeremiah, haven't you? A prophecy of the future. Jeremiah about thirty. Talk about the second Exodus. And the first uh, no, it's, it's uh, Jeremiah 31. And the first few verses here talk about the soon coming exodus out of the wilderness. And it comes down to uh, verse 9. Well, verse 8 says, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth and with them the blind and the lame. Now, why would they be blind and lame? We haven't seen atrocities at all yet. We haven't seen anything yet in spite of the atrocities of World War II when this incensed, demon-inspired, Satan-inspired Pope and false prophet stirs the people of Europe up against Americans, against Britain. They're going to consider they're no better than guinea pigs to be tested with. They're going to put out eyes. They're going to maim and lame people. The ones that survive are going to be a lot that don't survive. They're going to shoot them into outer space. They're going to be guinea pigs for the Europeans. So he says, among those that come out, they're going to be the lame and the blind. The woman with child, and her that travails with child together, a great company shall return hither or thither. They shall come with weeping and with supplication. Now, how in the world are Americans and Britons and Canadians and uh, Australians and Western Europeans going to know anything about Christ to fall them out and coming with weeping and supplications? Supplicating Christ, saying, please help us. Please make that new covenant with us. We want to serve you. If they were sent into captivity today, they wouldn't know anything about why they went. They know nothing about God's plan, nothing about the second coming of Christ, nothing about their role in the world to come. So somewhere they've got to be warned, then they've got to be continually encouraged by two witnesses until they finally see it. And they can become these people. He says, And I will lead them, I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Get that? Ephraim was not God's firstborn. Reuben was. This is talking about the world tomorrow. This is talking about a repentant Israel, at the head of which the Ephraimites are going to be the leaders. That's why the dream back in, as recorded in Genesis 37, that Joseph dreamed had significance not just to them. God wouldn't have had that written if it were just for Joseph and his brothers. They were dead when it was written. <laughs> it didn't do any good. You know, they liked it for their sake. They haven't read a word of it. <laughs> Joseph never did turn over to Genesis 37. Let me read about that dream again. Let me see. Is this the King James translation? Good. That's the one I want to love to read because it touches my heart. He never did read it. This was written for us upon whom the ends of the earth are coming. That dream was to show us that God is going to position the Israelites in the world of our under Joseph's leadership. And he's going to bless Israel, first of all, through Joseph and the whole world through Israel. Now, how is God going to get all these Israelites together and to follow the leadership of Christ through Ephraim? Except he let the French the Reubenites, the Gadites, the Swiss people, and the other Israelites of Western Europe join that United States of Europe and betray their brother Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, and come to hate that so much that they'll repent like the brothers did that hated Joseph way back then. Remember? I could put it in a little more blunt terms. They really hated him too. Now, the only reason those brothers finally came down to submit to Joseph was that God let them sell Joseph into slavery. Then he sent a famine on the land. Then Joseph said, go down to Egypt and get food, sons, because we are running out. 
Finally, when they came down and saw how God had used Joseph and that their very sustenance came from God through Joseph, they had different words. They repented. They were sorry. They were regretful for what they did to their brother Joseph. And then got the whole brothers together to follow and support Joseph, right? Now, that was all the type of the world tomorrow. So somewhere between now and the world of our God has to bring the brothers of Joseph to send him into slavery, come to hate that act, and finally recognize that their only hope in the world tomorrow is that God blesses them through Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. So he's going to let those brothers who hate Joseph's intestines, and the French don't love us at all, the Swiss don't, the Norwegians don't, the Swedes don't, the Finns don't, the Dutch don't, the Danes don't. And the Irish certainly don't. He's going to let them join that United States of Europe and have to do with selling Joseph into slavery. They're going to be warned in advance. Then they're going to come to hate that act and realize their only hope lies in Joseph and God blessing them through Joseph and then finally blessing the whole world through Israel. That's where the power of the two witnesses are going to be given comes into play. Now, what if you were, now you're not going to make, what if you were one of the two witnesses? And you'd already warned the United States and Canada that they were soon going to be overthrown by empowering Europe, and you'd already gotten the message out that God took to Jerusalem. What would you then decide on doing? Wanting the brothers not to do it, first of all, so they will be accountable for their actions. Now, would you think it'd be rather difficult to be in Jerusalem without a lot of power, to begin to try to get the attention of people up in Europe. How would you do it? <laughs> if you were in Jerusalem, how would you get the attention of French, of Swiss, of Danish, of, of Dutch, of the Luxembourgites, and the other Europeans? How would you get it? First of all, I would rely upon God initiating the means by which the attention was initially directed to Jerusalem. Now, how do you think God can do that? He's got a way of seeing hero yet to come. You know, they're going to they're going to be called the last many at the end of this work in the United States and Canada and Britain and around. And they're going to come to see this as God's church, but they're not going to establish all this authority. <laughs> authority is what they're going to stumble over. And you see, there's got to be a lot of authority there because when Mr. Armstrong says this is it, we've got to pool all of our money and get the final blast. The only reason you would uh, subscribe to this is because you recognize the authority of God through the man. If you didn't see that authority, you say, I think he's just whistling Dixie. <laughs> I don't think that means anything. I think he's just trying to get our money. And if you were one of those called in the 11th hour, you had a big bank account, you were a country club member, you might be a lawyer, a professor, an author of a book, on and on, you'd kind of want to hang on to that if you felt this country might continue for a while, wouldn't you? It'd be the last thing you'd give up. So that big group of people are going to be told, you've got to be a part, you've got to support with all of your means this work. And they say, huh, we believe this is God's church, we don't believe in all this authority. You think the setting is pretty right for people to discount authority? You think uh, the average American just loves authority, they're more looking for authority. I want someone to rule over them. I just can't stand it. You know, all the wives are saying, you know, you can just see it in the whole United States and Around the world, the wife saying, oh, I just love my husband rule me. I want his authority over me. Oh, I just love it. Is that right? And all children are going around saying, I just want that authority of my parents over me. I just love authority. And all men are just saying, I just love the police, the mayor, <laughs> and all the officials. I love Washington. Just like Mr. Dove loves the internal revenue. He's telling them about coming up here today, how they're treating him so well. They're squeezing. He says, that's all my blood. They say, we've got to get another quart. <laughs> in other words, the attitude of Americans and Britain and cities is now is they don't want authority over them. But we've got to have authority for that man when he says, here's what we're going to do. We have to recognize that authority is not his authority. That authority is God Almighty's authority. I don't think you're going to have to believe in that authority if he says, let's sell all of our property. Let's turn all of our assets into liquid assets and get all the money in for the final push. You have to really believe. You'd have to know there's authority there. Now those called in of substance, great intellects, 
in the last hour, that's what they're not going to believe in. But when we're gone, the term so is gone, Gunner Ted's gone, all of us are gone, then they're going to realize we were right and there was a voice. Then they're going to realize the tribulation is imminent and sure, and they've got to get close enough to God by the time of the tribulation to lose their heads, give them up, and acknowledge they didn't use them very well while they had them. And that's where the witness begins to start to attract people to Jerusalem. Because when the Pope begins to enforce, and the beast power begins to enforce the mark of the beast. And Mr. Dove showed me a clipping the other day that I think is quite plausible. It shows that in Europe right now, they are working on developing a computerized system of programming everyone in Europe to this computer, and everyone is going to be given a number on his forehead, his forehead and his right hand, and he cannot buy or sell except he be numbered, and his number is in this central computer, and all buying and selling is going to be controlled through that central computer. In other words, they see the world monetary system is an absolute wreck. And they're going to have to bring about some way of solving this world's currency problems. So the way by which they're going to do it in this coming United States of Europe is to have a program, a computer, in which everyone in Europe is programmed. And every time he goes to buy or sell, he is going to be checked by infrared Checking, or whatever they call it. You know, we're just checking. In other words, it won't be a visible number to the naked eye, but by putting that under infrared, it comes out. They can check anyone as to whether or not he is allowed to buy or sell. And all efforts, all payments will be made through this computerized system to eliminate currency completely. And so if you don't have that number, you don't buy or sell. If you're wondering, how could a beast power enforce a system on people where if you did not accept that mark, you could not buy or sell. Sure, there'd be all kinds of loopholes, except there's an ironclad way of preventing people from buying or selling, except they conform to the system. I think that's a very plausible way. And I think they're developing. And I think the information has substance. Now, when these people know this is God's church, they know that they have rejected authority, but they have repented of that rejection. They're in Europe. And they're being told by a Catholic-controlled Europe, you must subscribe to the national religion of Europe, or the religion of Europe, and you must work when we work, you must take off when we take off, and unless you subscribe to this program, you don't get the mark, and thereby you don't buy or sell. Either you have to renege on what God has shown you, or you have to refuse the mark of the beast. Now, over here in Revelation 20 is an interesting thing along that line, where it says in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls, or the individuals of them that were beheaded, get that, beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, the coming Catholic system, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the way it was is. Who were all going to die by the guillotine. And they're going to die because they will not accept the mark of the beast. Because to accept that they buy or sell, but to refuse it, you can't buy or sell. And how long do you think you could live if you couldn't buy or sell? If you're in an ironclad system whereby you can't buy nor sell unless you are part of that system, how long do you think you'd last if you couldn't buy or sell anything? About two or three days, maybe, as long as you can fast. That may not be that long, some of us. <laughs> About a day and a half, and you had it. Now, so these individuals are going to be the end result of our work in this present time, they're going to go into Europe. They're going to be made believers by the time they get there that Christ was working through this term stone and Gunner Ted in this work and he rejected the authority of Christ. And that those two men are the leaders, and that the beast and the false prophet are false. 
and so they're going to refuse to subscribe to the Catholic religion and the system of Europe. And by so refusing, they are going to be eliminated. And the way they're going to eliminate them is going to reactivate the guillotine. Now, that's the most sure way of getting people to recant. So here's a group of people that are God people. They have his spirit. They're no longer lukewarm. They're standing strong in Europe. They're being intimidated by uh, the Catholic system enforced by the military of Europe. And they're told, either you receive this mark, adopt the religion of Europe, adopt its ways, or we will eliminate you by the guillotine. And they say, well, eliminate it, because I cannot subscribe to this because I don't believe the system's right. I don't believe the Pope's right. What I believe are these two men in Jerusalem. I believe that those two men are the true servants of God, and this system is false. Say, okay. We're going to lob your head off. We're going to have your friends witness it. Now, if you were uh, among a dozen or so in a detention area, and you saw the guillotine out and you saw one of your friends' heads roll off, blood squirt out, you'd have to really know that you know and know that you know that there is a God, or you wouldn't allow your head to roll off. In other words, they would use that to try to get people to give up a religion that is counter to the Catholic system. Now, the very fact that there are going to be people over there who will not renege, who will allow their heads to be rolled off, is going to begin to affect Europeans in a very emotional way. They're going to see people that defy the Catholic Church, defy the European system, and claim they follow a couple of men in Jerusalem. And it's going to so affect these people, going to realize these people are dying for that belief. You think that might begin to get a lot of people in Europe begin to say, who are these two men? What are they saying? If they see people dying for something that is contrary to, counter to Europe, a lot of people are going to say, well, what are these people saying? What are these men saying? So that's the way by which God will get the attention of many people in Europe initially to begin to realize there are two men down in Jerusalem. <laughs> then once God gets their attention, he will begin to tell them certain things. Now, if I were one or two with you, you know what I'd do? Knowing the overall plan of God, I would, I would uh, utilize this system of broadcasting and telecasting from Jerusalem. They're already developing, and this is already in the works of developing a worldwide satellite system so they can broadcast and telecast from Jerusalem. I mean, that is not something they're just planning. That's something they're already expecting to develop, I mean, to, to launch. And I think I would go in there if I, if I were Mr. Armstrong's shoes and I had the Israelis, as you know, and their confidence, and God had declared, you know, and made sure that Jerusalem was declared an international city open to all religions and all beliefs, and as long as you're in that international city, you can speak what you feel. That's why the Pope and the two witnesses can speak counter things in the same city. It'll be the only place on the face of the earth that's internationalized that guarantees freedom of expression of any party. You can see why that has to be. Why the Pope would even agree to that when you've got Jews and Arabs there. You're trying to bring about peace. You have to accommodate both beliefs. And if you open it up to their beliefs, you have to open it up to others as well. I'm sure the Pope would not want Catholicism to be excluded. Would you? And since he, uh, he wouldn't want that, then he's going to get in the trap just like the Bible. You know, the, the Catholics tried to exclude the revelation from the canon, but they got into a trap. I can't just explain the details, but it's explaining in uh, Gibbons Rome pretty well as to why we have the book of Revelation. They were actually gotten into a trap where if they denied the book of Revelation, they denied the inspiration of the Bible. So they had to accept Revelation because it was a part of that which they put their stamp of approval on. So in the future, if the Pope, you know, declares that anyone has the right of freedom of expression from Jerusalem, it allows the two witnesses also in that particular area. Now, if you were standing there 
in Jerusalem, and you had access because you were very close to these Israeli leaders, and you also had a lot of people who pooled their money in the last minute that could not be used getting the final message out, and we converted all that currency to one currency we knew would be good, and all that money was deposited in the bank in Jerusalem. And you could utilize it and use the Israelis to buy whatever you wanted in Europe and use that to buy time on their radio and television stations? Would you begin to broadcast to Chileans? And say, what are you people down in Chile doing? No, I would, uh, I would begin to beam those messages to France, to Switzerland, to uh, 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 Holland, Belgium, and I began to tell those people who are now looking down and realize there are a couple of men down there that many people are dying for because they believe what these two men are saying. So they're listening in. And these two men say, Now you French people are Reubenites. You are Israelites. You are really brothers to the Americans and the British and the Canadians. Now, don't do what you're about to do. Don't turn and join the Germans and join the Italians and join the Spanish because you're not their kind. Don't you dare join them and betray your brother Joseph just like your forefathers betrayed Joseph into Egypt or God will deal with you. Now, what do you think the uh, Swiss people who are Gadites or the French people who are Reubenites, what do you think they might say by way of argument? I said, well, we're not Israelites, we're Gentiles. What gives you the idea that you know we're Reubenites? They come back and say, well, to convince you we know your identity, and our message is not from men but from God, we're going to stop your reign. We won't let the reign anymore on France. See, it says they'll have power to shut up heaven, and we're not going to shut up heaven down in Chile. Because you stop the complaining and shut it three and a half years, then three and a half years, those that survive it. They say, why hasn't the rain? Oh, what's happened? What'd you learn? We learned it hasn't rained three and a half years. Sure dry. <laughs> Muy dry. <laughs> <laughs> but if you direct the message to the French, and you say, you Frenchmen are Reubenites. You're actually brothers of Britain, who are Ephraimites, along with Canada, and with Manassas, we're the Americans. And we don't want you to join forces with that United States of Europe that we know is coming and betray your brother Joseph. Then they say, okay, we're going to let you know that we speak by authority because we're going to stop the rain on your country. It will rain on the Germans, but will not rain past the French border. You think God knows the border? <laughs> It does. Just right at the top, right there. Right on the border. Every time it rains, it rains on the German side, and it doesn't rain a drop on the French side. All right, they might have plush crops over there. They say, okay, we're going to send a plague of grasshoppers. And what you have over there is going to be eaten, and you won't have any rain to produce anymore. Now, they won't believe the message, but that's going to be quite a witness. I mean, you would think that any knucklehead would get the message. If two men stop the rain, and if two men could send plagues, and it happens as they direct, you should begin to realize the message they have is of the same God that controls the rain. So they'll use that for six months to ensure the message has power behind it, so they can't say later, well, God had you only... Uh, performed in a powerful enough manner, we would have you, Lord, for we've been on your side. I don't know how much more powerful you can be if you stop the rain and send plagues. I mean, that's speaking pretty loudly. <laughs> Even Texas hear that when stops over here. It doesn't have to stop three or four months. You hear it all around. What has the rain? I wonder what's happening. I wonder if we're going to grow. Better get rid of all we stock. We won't make a crop. Got to borrow some money. Do you think we can get some cheap loans? <laughs> Lord declared a disaster area. Well, they began to, you know, just three or four months, farmers began to speak out, ranchers. You can imagine what, was, what will be the case after six months in Western Europe. But now the pressures of being a part of this union of Europe 
and all are going to be too great, so they're going to go ahead and, and be a part of that system which betrays Joseph into slavery. Then the two witnesses are going to say, you shouldn't have done it. He's your only hope. If your brother Joseph, whom you have swept come into slavery into this spiritual system in Europe, if he does not survive through the tribulation in the world of art, you don't stand the chance because God will only bless you through Joseph. And is there hurt further by drought, by uh, uh, a lack of production in Western Europe? And the two witnesses continue to hammer away, saying so you better pull out this combine. Because unless you do, God will plague you when he intervenes to punish Babylon. You've read Revelation 18, verse 4. It says, Come out of her, my people, lest you be partakers of her plagues. That's not talking to you and me directly. It's talking to the, a group of nations in the Babylonian system just before the heavenly signs occur. God's going to send his plagues out after the heavenly signs. So after they have warned them initially for six months, they go ahead and and have a part in selling the brother Joseph into slavery, and they're warned another two years, finally they're going to get the message, but they're going to be afraid to pull out until they have the signs occur. And then when God intervenes and stops the sun from shining its full strength for a short season, and turns the moon into blood, appearance of blood, then these uh, Europeans who are Israelites are going to finally get the message and fear God more than fearing the Germans and and uh, the other Gentiles of Europe, for you know, for some time before the heavenly sign, they will wish they could pull out, but they will fear retaliatory measures. Because this system will control the space program by way of which they can knock out Western Europe, knock out France, knock out Switzerland, at will. But when God interrupts the system, they'll say it's time to pull out. We're scared now. So God begins to break up that system. He says it won't last for long because it's a mixture of iron and clay. And iron typifies Gentiles, and clay typifies this one. God will drive the clay of Jesus. The whole system is all apart. So the two witnesses will tell them before they have the sign, you'd better pull out of this combine, lest you be partakers of these plagues God's going to pour out on the Babylonian system. That's when they'll pull out. And they'll begin to pull out. And they'll say, we're sorry we did it, Joseph. We know that our only hope is God through you. You must be our leader. God has made sure you're the people through whom he can bless the world to a greater degree than through any of us. He once got two eyes. He was just one will be enough. And you analyze the American people and the British people and then contrast them to the Swiss people, to the uh, French people, or whomever, and you'll realize that we have the talents to use wealth in a much more profound manner than any other of the Israelites tribes. God doesn't want to begin to bless the world through uh, Benjamin. The Norwegians, they don't have enough. They don't have the makeup to be world leaders through whom God can really bless the world. He doesn't want to bless them through Reuben. They still don't have the talents that both Ephraim and Manasseh has. Ephraim has the talents to colonize. Manasseh has the talent to make things work in a big way. They've got to be brought to repentance, and then they're going to be the leaders, and God will begin to develop a commonwealth of nations around the world through Ephraim's example. And then he will come along and show, when these programs are introduced to Ephraim, he will use Manasseh to show other nations, here's how you become great by following these programs. And they have the potential of being the leaders above any of the other Israelites. Then all of Israel has the potential of being the leaders through whom God can bless the Gentiles. And it's got to be according to that system that God blesses in the world tomorrow. So we've got to bring these Josephites to deep repentance first, so when they're put in that leading position, they're going to be humble and not proud and vain. So he's going to rub their nose in the tribulation in such a way they're going to really repent deeply. Then he's going to bring the brothers to where they hate the way they've gone. And they're willing to accept Joseph. And then when all those who are in Western Europe, by the end of the day of the Lord, at least up to the time Christ comes, and Christ has let the uh, Nazi world and the communist world have it out, and they're finally fighting down in the valley of Megiddo, and up through the valley of Jehoshaphat, and Christ intervenes to destroy.
destroy those armies. Then he will have his people, Israel, in Western Europe. Some of them will be in Egypt and other places, but the majority of them will be in Western Europe. And he will have them there willing to follow Joseph, and Joseph willing to follow Christ. Then he will bring them into the land of Palestine and be ready to re-educate them. Now, where do we come on the scene? We've got to be there ready to re-educate them. Do you think God could bring all these Israelites to repentance through the tribulation and the day of the Lord, bring them into the land of Palestine, they're ready to be taught, and then say, fold your hands, I don't have anyone to teach you yet. Now, if I get real busy, maybe in six months or a year I'll have something to teach you. You'd lose it, because people are going to revert to their past practices unless you have something to give them in place of that from which they turn. It's like Mr. Newell Sermonette. God is going to say, repent, now go back and do what you repented of. And bring them out of captivity and say, now I don't have anything better to offer. Maybe you better go back to democracy. All your religion, the brand of your choice, along with your cigarettes. So he's got to have a group ready at that time when he lives in the land of Palestine and has churches, schools, colleges, recreation, entertainment, culture, everything else, family life, and say, here's the way we want to show you how to walk in it. Why would God want to protect his people otherwise? Why would God want to protect the Philadelphia era of his church through the tribulation of their Lord up to Christ coming unless there's a purpose? It's hard enough when we get together to grow. Have you ever noticed someone's been isolated by himself for a long period of time and he still do like he was a long time ago? So if God would leave you and me to ourselves three and a half years out in the evil and people dying all around us, you wouldn't be any better off after three and a half years than you were before. Why would God then put you through three and a half years if I hurt you rather than help you? Talk about weirdo. He's <laughs> probably by myself. You know, for three and a half years, look at the walls, Christ changed me. No telling what I might do to frighten people away in Palestine. They say, You're a weirdo. Where have you been? I've been hiding out for three and a half years all by myself. I've been eating wild honey. Locusts. I've been wearing sheep. <laughs> this is what you look like. <laughs> Once you got your hair, I've been growing no barbers for any of you. You think we could be ready to teach people? <laughs> I see no purpose that if God puts us all together. On this phase of the work is over, he takes all of his churches from Australia, all of the churches from South Africa, Rhodesia, United States, Canada, the islands, Europe, and all around and he brings us to one place and puts us together, he will put together a society and give birth to that society overnight, so to speak, in one day. Because he only has the churches. It's just a matter of gathering them all around the world to one place, and he forms a society in which there are only churches of God, in which there are people, all of whom believe in God, worship God on the same day in the same way, and are there to grow together, not only to perfect religion, but to raise up many more churches so when the time comes for the general exodus out of the north country, they will be able to give a sufficient number of churches to all those millions and begin to teach them here is how you worship God. I can see a purpose in that. And when God takes his people down, if we didn't have the experience of imperial schools, how would we be able to formulate a system of teaching our young children right off unless we have the experience of having done it? If God has not built a college program for 30-something years, or about 30 now, I guess it is, and had the experience of all that which takes his people to one place, how would we begin to develop a system that would have to be perfected within three and a half years? If we have not had any experience in dealing with young people like in Orr, Minnesota, up in Scotland, around the world, how would we, we be able to introduce to our young people immediately a program that keeps them interested and occupied? I brought all of our teenagers down there and said, okay, teenagers, fold your hands, look up, and remain quiet till we figure out a way of developing a program for you. They might just begin to say, I'd go back to pot. 
Most of that, you know, we do on the here, sit on it. So God is giving us all this experience, so when he puts us together, he has enough working, so we become a society under him by way of religious control, and bound together by educational control, so we are successful from the word go. And then for three and a half years, he perfects that group of people. And they're being able to relate to God more and more perfectly. And they're able to develop that religious system so it can be carried over into the world tomorrow and given to these Israelites. And when they come to the land of Palestine, they say, this system you've given us is so far above anything we thought was right religion that we know now we never want to turn back to four squares and three squares and up, upperism, downerism, first, second, third, and this, that, and the other. We're fed up with it. We realize now that religion was designed by God to show us how to relate to God and worship Him. Did you see the uh, news the other day of the Spanish-speaking Mexicans in San Diego? Their mother was on this plane that was hijacked, and their little brother, they were praying. They had beads. They were saying the rosary. What does that have to do with worshiping God? You like to break God once down here, going through the beads. If I, if I go, if I, if I make enough laps around the beads, maybe you'll do something for me. That's superstition. God wants us to worship Him, to love Him, to honor Him, to worship Him, to recognize Him, and express that praise and honor to Him. Not get a lot of beads, not get cross-eyed, and wear talons on our fingers, making a certain number of laps around the beads. So, when we introduce a religious system into the land of Palestine, these systems like they're going to be so turned on by that system, they're going to realize why God has brought them to repentance, to turn completely from what they thought was true religion, in whatever form they followed. We've got to introduce an educational system, a system of recreation, entertainment, culture, athletics, and everything else that will so impress these Israelites by the time they come to the land of Palestine they're going to say God's way is so much greater so much better so much more desirable than anything we've ever even thought of that there's no comparison now how could God introduce something that would so captivate Israelites if we all hit out <laughs> and they say man we creep around they say what is it Halloween no we just looked that way <laughs> we've just been beaten and tattered and torn we just look like we've got masks on. This is really it. You know what it is? That's your face. <laughs> so God is going to introduce his way in the world of ours through the Philadelphians, and he has to have a way so highly developed that it's going to impress these people so they're going to desire it above anything they've ever desired and begin to function with any. I think there's a purpose in a place of final training when you see it in that light. And God does do, do things, does things, in a logical, practical manner. But he's building a logical, practical family to live under a logical, practical father who is going to be the head of the family. So he can take us down to a place of final training in three and a half years. We can perfect the religious system, the educational system, and begin to analyze how many churches must we have to introduce the land of Palestine to relate to all these who are going to come out of the captivity. We might have to buy some pretty sophisticated computers by way of the Israelis from the Germans and begin to feed all this data of the present population of the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, South Africa, and so forth, and then say, God, a third disappeared this way, a third died this way, another third went into captivity, one tenth of them will survive. Therefore, we have this number of people that are going to come to the land of Palestine with this basic makeup. Therefore, we will need this number of churches, this number of colleges, this number of schools, this number of programs to relate to that number of people. Then you're preparing in a professional, meaningful manner. We're not going to go down there fold rain and crush rock. God has a lot more in mind for us than crushing rock. I repeat, God would not protect us unless there's a purpose. I'd be better off dead, so would you. And just surviving through a meaningless three and a half years. Mr. Armstrong wrote some time ago, 
Let me see if I can find the right bulletin. This was the June 1777 bulletin, where Mr. Armstrong said, he said, I'm breaking into a sentence here. He says, Revelation 12, 9, and succeeding verses show Satan and his demons persecuting the remnant church, the lay of the end, for the Philadelphia church is to be taken to a place of safety during the Great Tribulation. Then he quotes Revelation 12, verse 14, and Revelation 3, verse 10. Then he goes on and says, Revelation 12, 17 shows Satan persecuting the remnant of the church, which is the very last part of it at the time, therefore lay of the sin. He's going to protect the Philadelphians in Satan when he tries to destroy us. He comes down to the Middle East to try and do that, and God opens up the earth to swallow up the army. Then he's going to turn to attack the remnant, the lay of the sin. He's going to try to destroy them in the tribulation. Now, he will succeed, but God will use that as a, pur- as a purposeful thing to begin to turn Europeans to the two witnesses. See, what God does is logical and practical. He will not, uh, he did not design a Laodicean era to go into the tribulation and lose their heads except he had a purpose for them not only to get to his family and assist Christ in his office in the world tomorrow, but to begin to turn Europeans are going to be hypnotized by the Pope and the false prophets to someone else outside of Europe at the very beginning of the tribulation. And Mr. Armstrong said that. He mentioned... Uh, here in another newsletter to us. This was the pastoral newsletter, March the 9th, 1977. He says, There is yet to come the Laodicean era of the church. It definitely has not yet started. That's what he said. Who do you think has the authority to make the final statement in God's church? The church learns it on each God's apostle. You know, the Bible is very clear. It says, First apostles, secondarily prophets, an evangelist. So the leader in God's church is an apostle, and he's the one that has the final authority. Remember what he said to Pete a year ago? He said, I'm in charge. He said, the policy and doctrine is not established by committees. I'm the one that establishes doctrine. He says, I'm in charge of the church. Garner's head is nice, and Garner's head is second. But I'm in charge. He wrote us the book, and he said, you heard it from me. Man, you've heard it from the highest human authority. God has always used one leader, and I'm that leader. He said the labor sin here hasn't come. You know who I prefer to believe? Mr. Kurt Armstrong. As long as he's alive, now he's going to be alive for quite a long while. And I think as long as that man's alive, cop, obedience, and loyalty is to be to him. Secondly, to Ted. I support Dr. Ted as much as anyone in the work, and I've supported him for years in tour. But always is number two. Maverick, number one. And he'll have to become number one, but number one dies. And I don't think number one's going to die. Not because he ain't tweeted, he probably doesn't. But because God, God, he's on his throne in heaven. Now he said in one place here, he says, we're pioneering for the world of war about the educational program. If I should want to read here, maybe not. Over here, he says, I have now, well, he mentions here about this power to come in Europe. He said, the time is near for a perp, pope, perp, <laughs> a pope, probably not the present one, to extend his good graces to the nations of Europe and to bring them together but only as a union of church and state with the Pope at its head, so that everyone will be forced to become Catholic within their jurisdiction, that is, you know, within European confines. But this is the power that will start World War III and conquer Britain and the United States. That will be the time of the Great Tribulation when the mark of the beast will be enforced and the true Christians will be tortured and martyred. Now he goes and he says, I have now brought you to the point where we are right now in prophecy. I am now fulfilling Revelation 10. I believe that. I don't believe he's just, uh, you know, blowing out words. I believe he's inspired. He knows where he is. He knows God's behind him. He knows what he's fulfilling. 
I am now fulfilling Revelation 10, one of them insert chapters, verses 10 and 11, the gospel going to kings to become a witness for all nations. If you will follow through the next verses, continuing in the 11th chapter, I was in that little early reading about the two witnesses, we come to the two witnesses. The time is near for their three and a half year ministry to start. You, their ministry will end at the coming of Christ. You find them identified in Haggai and Zechai. I'm trying to get through, the more I try, the slower I get. The more behind I get. You find them identified in Haggai and Zechariah, chapters 1 through 4. Also, the fulfillment of Malachi 3, verses 1 through 4, which refers to the second coming of Christ and other such prophecies. Very possibly, the Great Tribulation will end our present work and bring in the Laodicean church. The real persecution and martyrdom will be on the Laodicean church. I have felt that, brother, and I have felt that without reservation ever since I've been preaching on God's overall plan. That if we serve God faithfully, and get his work done, he's not going to put us in the tribulation. The tribulation is designed to bring about repentance. And those who have not repented fully to accept that authority, plus the Israelites, the Josephites, they will be plunged in the tribulation to bring about repentance. Now, if we've already repented, why would God put us through that which is designed to bring about repentance? That's why he says the Philadelphia era will be protected during the three and a half years yet to come. He says the real persecution and martyrdom will be on the Laodicean church. The Philadelphia era, to whom the doors are open to get the gospel of the world, will be protected from the great tribulation. I think God is, as he said, they're identified, you know, he said the two witnesses are identified in Zechariah and Haggai. I think God wants us to understand that in this light, that he didn't just look down in his random select two men, select a man and give him a son by accident, you know. That God looked down and saw all these good people down there and he said, Son, who we're going to choose? He said, I don't know, it's a hard choice. He said, Okay, son, let's put all these names on marble. We have enough marble, he said, I think so. <laughs> let's put their names on marble. I want to blindfold you, son, and let's turn this great big old a barrel in which we have all these marbles on which all these names of these potential goodies are. And the one you pull out is going to be he. And he just happened to pull out and said, who'd you get? Oh, that's his name. Herbert, let's see. Yeah. Herbert Armstrong. He said, well, at least the name's a little better than Elbert Peabody. <laughs> but I had no idea you'd get it. <laughs> Do you think that God just chose at random, or he typed these two men 3,000 years ago because this particular era of his church is so significant to establishing a theme of life for the world tomorrow? To building a worldwide society under God by way of religious control and bound together through educational control that God could not take a chance and get a wrong type tool, but had to make sure the tools were just right so that he could begin to develop toward the world tomorrow a religious and educational system using the personality of these two men to incorporate that in his development. I think he did. That's why I think he typed them in. 3,000 years ago, so we could have confidence in the leadership that wasn't at random and just a random selection, but already predetermined and typed over 3,000 years ago from Zerubbabel and Joshua. That's why the connection between them and the two witnesses. So uh, I think the world is going to come to realize that God is very much in charge of the way he's going to build his family. That he's not, he didn't say, I want to build a family. And Christ said, What do you mean? He says, I don't care. Just throw anything together and I'll accept it. Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, let's face that we come to it. Or don't you think God had to be very careful about the way he planned to build his family? So when he's here with the family, he can share life and wealth and opportunity and power with that family on an ever increasing basis forever. Now, a lot of families just put together by accident and four or five members don't last very long. You ever notice that? God is going to have multiple divisions in his family. So he couldn't take a chance on developing that family at 
random or by chance. So he's showing here he's very selective and very precise in raising up a man, raising up through that man an educational religious program, and giving that man a son to assist him. And had to have everything necessary to point He's got the looks, he's got the talent, he's got the ability, he's got the aptitude, and everything required. What does it look like for Abel Gurdy's brother? What he was tongue twice, and on and on. Wouldn't work, would it? So God had to make sure not only of the leader, but the one who would be raised up to assist him. So it's a well-planned program. So we have to be ready, not only for the final training, but in the world war, to introduce to these Israelites who are brought out of the tribulation as a result of this work, proper religion and proper education, and education is not just restricted to a classroom, but to give them social direction. Give them direction and entertainment, culture, athletics, family life, social life, and on and on and on. It has to do with a proper society. Now, in closing, I want to turn read our job description. You know, God gives us quite a job description here. And most people, you know, if you were just being hired out for a particular job, you would normally want a job description. You know, most people don't go in and say, well, I want to hire out and the boss is going to hire you. And the boss doesn't tell the employee what to do, and the employee doesn't look, he just rambles around. It wouldn't be very successful, would it? Normally, the employee wants to know of the employer, what would you have me do? You must have hired me for some purpose. He says, yeah, here's what I want you to do. So he gives them a job description. Now, God is a lot more professional than some businessman. So God is very concerned about his people seeing their job description when he has to tell the one and realizing the necessary steps in fulfilling that job description. The good thing I like about our job description is it goes forever. You'll never lose your job, never be unemployed. He shows us here not only what we're going to do now, but in the world of art and for all eternity. Let's read that job description here briefly. I'll try to finish here in What time is the employer? Oh, that's too late. I'm going to check how white is that. Good. That's one, 101. <laughs> it won't take long. I'm just going to read about five verses or so. Revelation 3, commencing verse 7. This is the job description of the Philadelphia Euro. And of the angel of the church in the Philadelphia right. First thing is we're called the church of brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia means. God is love, he's going to teach the world the way of love, and the ones through whom he's going to teach the world the way of love are the Philadelphians who must learn the way of love in advance so they can teach it. So we're just better learning when we get to final training. We'll have three and a half years of intensive living all together in developing and promoting the way of love and introducing it into the world of law and all the facilities necessary to teach that way to the millions who are going to be delivered out of captivity into the land of Palestine, and we must re-educate to be an example to other nations so they will subscribe to that thing when become a part of that expanding society. He says, These things say of he that is holy and he that is true. Now normally when you you go to be employed, you like to is the is the boss honest, is he a man of his word, is he a man of integrity? Well, Christ wants us to realize now, our leader, Jesus Christ, is holy and he's true. And you know that he is absolute true. He says everything works together to those who love him. God lets a lot of problems exist. You know why? Because he's dealing with human beings. And we're just kind of problem prone. And when he put together, he knew when he put together a vast network, a worldwide work in this end time of rebellion against the Lord, of all kinds of divisions in society and, and uh, politics and all worldwide, and he begins to call people out of all this worldwide, there would be many problems. And we'd have to trust him to get us all through this, find it, deliver us from the tribulation, put us together, and eliminate a lot of spots, blemishes, and wrinkles. These spots, the Australians, these Scots, the Scottish, and on and on. And finally, by the end of that final training, have us ready to be presented to Christ without spot, blemish, wrinkle, 
or anything else would tarnish. As he promises in Ephesians 5, that he will present the woman unto himself, not having spot, nor wrinkle, nor any such thing. That's why the final three and a half years to eliminate all the spots the Australians have, the South Africans have, the Americans have, and every other spot we have, because we're not yet in a position to eliminate all these various incongruities and all that exist. And it's not easy to control the worldwide work at headquarters when you've got Satan there with all this power fighting. You've got all the complications of human beings and emotions and coming from all backgrounds of life and all areas of the world. It's not easy. But he says, I'm holy and I'm sure I know where I'm going. You hang on. I'm going to show you the victory. I won't make it easy, I'll make it possible. I won't make it easy, otherwise you wouldn't be worth having. I want to train you and discipline you, and I want to develop some spiritual muscle. So you've got to tug and pull and struggle. But he says, I'm holy and I'm true, and I'm going to bring you to the place where you know brotherly love, so through you I can show the rest of the world love. He says, I'm holy and I'm true, and I have the key of David. You know what a key is for? A key opens and closes. And he is going to use that from the throne of David like the key to open up true religion and true education to worldwide proportions. And he says, when I open, no one's going to shut. And when I shut, no one's going to open. So we have to shut off all false religion and all false education worldwide and replace it with true education and true religion. The ones through whom he's going to do that are going to be the educators. They must be prepared to introduce right religion on education as Christ puts down false religion and false education. He says, I know your works. Behold, I set before you an open door. So there's another point where God sits an open door to get the job done, get the message out, and preparing the world tomorrow. And no man can shut it. That's quite a promise. It's good to be back and see you. I'll be going back to Florida next week. Get another vacation, probably in a year or less. I'll be back to see you. In fact, you can endure my sermons once a year. You'll probably all make it. <laughs>